Amen, amen, amen. Good morning, good morning, good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it.
Paul, will you stand with me? Will you stand and let's give God praise? Let's give God honor. Let's give God glory. Come on, let all my worship, let all my praise. thank you, we praise you, we honor you, we magnify your name. We thank you, God, for speaking through a song, but speaking through your Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, for reminding us that everything we do and all that we are about is to give you honor and glory. And on this Sabbath day, God, we thank you for lifting up your spirit inside of us. And God, we pray that the spirits of all worshiping, all listening, all watching, all observing, God, will indeed be drawn closer to you as we give you praise. Thank you, God, for being a healer. Thank you, God, for being a deliverer. Thank you, God, for being a prayer-answering God. Thank you, God, for making ways out of no way. Thank you, God, for giving us one more time, one more chance, one more opportunity. And for that, God, we give you praise. Thank you, God, for what we are about to receive. You've already prepared a word for us. And God, we are grateful with an attitude of gratitude now to receive your instructions. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts continue to be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our most blessed Redeemer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, let all the God's children say together, Amen. Say Amen again. Now, will you give God an ovation again for being in your life, over your life, through your life, and all of that God wants to be for us today? Amen. If you could, please remain standing in the sanctuary and at your homes or wherever you're watching or listening as we read God's word today coming to us from the Old Testament book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 through 19 from a New Living Translation. It is a little bit longer than what we're normally accustomed to reading, but it is Sunday, amen? It says, remember the Sabbath day, not the Sabbath minute, not the Sabbath hour. So we got all day to finish reading this. Is that all right? Let's read, starting at verse 8 from a New Living Translation, Daniel chapter 1. Let us read the word of God together. Here's what the word says. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. And now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. But he responded, I am afraid of my Lord, the king, who has ordered that you, you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age, I am afraid the king will have me beheaded. And Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Uh, please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of the 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. And then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. And so after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. And God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. 
And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated giving God thanks and praise for who God is, what God does, and how God moves in our lives. Calling your attention to verse 13 of this pericope as it serves as our backdrop for today's sermon. Here's what the word says. And at the end of the 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. At the end of 10 days, Daniel says, see how we look as compared to the other young men eating the king's food. And at the end of 10 days, he says, then make your decision to see what you like. In essence, Daniel is trying to get the king and the king's court to understand, I'm about ready to start a new habit. That's our subject today, my friends, starting a new habit. Smile at the person beside you with a Holy Ghost smile and tell them, say, you look like you could use some new habits. Amen. Amen. At home right now, at home, you just simply type in the, in the chat box, I'm starting some new habits, starting some new habits. My friends, there is a word in our vocabulary that has impacted our society, influenced our culture, and turned the direction of history. There is a word, y'all, in our lexicon that has integrated our philosophy, has footnoted our glossary, and altered our decision-making to where now right is questionable and wrong is perceived right. My friends, and the word that, 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 is, that I'm speaking of is not exclusive to the halls of academia, nor is it relegated to the powerful and the privilege. But this word is heard from the White House to the State House, from the inner city to the suburbs, from the boardroom to the bid whiz table, from the bus stop to the loading dock. And the word I'm speaking of, y'all, is a word simply called compromise. Can you say compromise? As a noun, compromise, it, it means an agreement or a settlement of a dispute that is reached uh, by each side making a concession. Compromise, as, as a verb, Pastor Rick, it, it is to accept the standards that are lower than desirable. And just what happens, my friends, when we compromise? Well, to start with, it weakens our ability to overcome the challenge the next time. When we compromise, we, we give in to the easy and refrain from pressing through the harder. When we compromise, y'all, we opt out for what may be right to accept what might be fashionable. When we compromise, we lower our principles and, and favor our pride and popularity. Friends, when we compromise, please know it, it never assess, eases the tension. It only weakens the resolve. Let me see if I can illustrate what compromise is. A story is told, Pastor Lanson, of, from Pastor Charles Goodman of the Tabernacle Baptist Church in Augusta. He, he tells the story of a father who had these three young teenage sons. And, and in his household, y'all, he had a level of standards of morality and what was acceptable and what was non-acceptable, what they listened to and what they watched. And, and so it happened that these three teenage sons, they, they, they came to their father with a proposition because a new movie was coming out. 
And they knew that this movie was not really going to be acceptable, Brother Sean, at, at the standards of the father. And, and they said, that, Dad, we've done some research. We've talked to our friends. And we recognize that this movie may have some words that you don't want us to use. It may have some scenes that you don't want us to see. But it's just a little bit, Dad. And we think that we are old enough to take it. And we want to know, can we go watch this movie? And so the dad says, well, well, give me 24 hours and, and I'll give you my decision. And so that evening or the next day, they, they came to the father, summoned them to the kitchen table. And he says, I, I got my decision and my decision is based upon, well, first of all, I, I want you to know I made this plate of brownies for you. And this plate of brownies is a good plate of brownies. Matter of fact, these are the best brownies you will uh, ever taste. It, it's a secret recipe. The, the chocolate is rich and ported. The, it's moist. And, and these are good. I just want you, if you eat one brownie, then that would determine if we go to the movie. And the boys were like, well, that's easy to do. And the father says, well, wait, one more thing I've got to say. The, the brownies, though they are made with imported chocolate and they are moist, as you will all imagine, the brownies, y'all, they, they, they are made with a little bit of horse manure. Now, you won't taste the horse manure because it's been cooked at 350 degrees. And, and you won't smell the horse manure because it's, it's mixed in with the brownies. And, and you won't even know it's just a little bit. It won't really impact you. It, it's just a little bit in there. So, matter of fact, you won't even know it. You, if I didn't tell you it was there, you wouldn't have known it was there. So, so here, son, just help yourself to some brownies. We well, all know that the boys did not eat the brownies that day. And, and the moral of the story is that every now and then we have to be careful when we compromise because what we may think is a good thing is loaded with a little bit of horse. Every now and then, you have to be careful of how you let certain people come into your sphere of influence because it may be loaded with a little bit of horse. And please understand, y'all, my invitation to, uh, is there because there's always a temptation for all of us to compromise. You know what it's like as, as you are climbing the ladders of success. You may not have thought the way that you're thinking now, but in order to get that promotion, you have to compromise. You know what it's like. You, you want to sit at the table with the cool kids, but sometimes the cool kids want you to do things and say things that you should not say, so you have to compromise. Well, for we're all tempted to compromise, my friends. Compromise from speaking up when, when we ought to we ought, ought feel that we can't really speak up because it may jeopardize our future. We compromise. We've been tempted to compromise and, and not say grace in, in front of a meal when we're out with a co-worker and don't want to say prayer over the banquet meal when we're out with the boss. Compromise. Tempted to tempted not to give your best as a teacher, tempted not to do your best as a student, tempted not to show your best as a volunteer, tempted not to share your best as a witness of Jesus Christ. Friends, I just want you to know from the onset of this sermon, you cannot compromise. Matter of fact, look at your neighbor and say, don't compromise. Come on, type it right there in the chat box. Say, don't compromise. You, you, you see, because in this first chapter of Daniel, what is loaded here, y'all, are many lessons on faith and lessons on decision making and lessons on influence and lessons on identity. But, but what I find most prominent, my friends, is a lesson on starting some new habits based on the principle of not to compromise, not to compromise. Let's go to the text because Daniel reminds us, y'all, as a faithful disciple of the Lord, that there's a strong temptation to compromise. 
he's determined, y'all, to trust uh, the Lord, to be steadfast in God's word. And no matter what, no matter how much pressure was put upon him not to compromise. Therefore, when Daniel is confronted with a crisis in the king's paddles, palace, he is almost, y'all, uh, uh, at the point of being, if he doesn't follow the rules, he's going to be possibly put in prison or, or possibly executed. But the scripture describes that he's got discipline. He's got a new habit, in which case it prevents him from compromising. And before I go any farther, just, just what is the question of a habit? What is a habit? Well, uh, defined by the, by the dictionary, a habit is an acquired behavior pattern regularly followed, y'all, until uh, it, it becomes almost involuntary. A, a habit, that's, that, that's like looking both ways before you cross the street. Uh, a habit is like putting your seatbelt on as soon as you get in the car. A habit like cutting the radio on in the car just because you need the radio on a habit like cutting the television on in the house not that you're watching anything but you just need some noise in the background you know some habits y'all y'all got some habits amen I mean, don't get all holy on me on Sunday because you're in church. But those at home, you got some habits right now. You you ain't put on Sunday clothes in two years. I ain't hating, just stating that that's your new habit. You. Habits, again, they, they, they come to us uh, in an involuntary way. Now, now, Stephen Covey says it like this. He says that habit is the intersection of knowledge, that is, what to do and skill, how to do it, and desire a want to do it. Again, what, what is a habit? It is an intersection of knowledge, a knowledge of what to do, a skill of how to do it, and a desire of a want to do it. Daniel made a decision, y'all on what to do. That was his knowledge. He, he made a decision not to defile himself. That was his skill, his how-to, and he was not going to eat the food and the wine at the king's table. That was a desire. Again, he, he made a knowledgeable decision. Uh, he made a skillful decision, and he made a decision based upon desire. These lead to habits, and when it comes to starting some new habits, I don't want anybody to do anything Thing without thinking about what you're going to do. In essence, think about the habit. Think, think about the outcome. Think about the result of your habits. Whatever it is you want to take on in 2022, make sure it's knowledgeable, but also make sure you got some skill and some know-how. I can't be, uh, Brother L, uh, my habit to play the piano and sit down at the church on Sunday without taking some lessons. I need some skill. I, I, I just can't be, 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 be at the soundboard back there pushing buttons. I, I, I got a TV at home and I got a remote, but you don't control the soundboard at the church like you control it at your home. You need some skill. Whatever it is, you have to have some skill about yourself and a desire. That's so important that we have a desire in this habit. Again, it's not what you do. It's who you become. Okay, okay. I'm going to work and unpack that a little bit later, but I don't miss that. It's y'all, it's not a doing thing in 2022. You have to be a being thing. I, I want to be more like Christ. I want to be more humble. I want to be more kind. I want to be more loving. I want to be more accepting. I want to be more forgiving. And you see, as I move from my doing to my being, it becomes a habit. You see, that was that, that this is not a trivial thing that Daniel is dealing with, y'all, because according to, to God's word, the food, the food laws, uh, they were certain things pro prohibited for the Jewish community. God's word also gave a warning against strong drink. Proverbs 20, verse 1, Proverbs 23, verse 20, Proverbs 23, verse 32, Isaiah 5, verse 11, Nahum 1, verse 10, Habakkuk 2, verse, I guess I've given you enough prohibition scriptures. And it's really talking about getting drunk with strong drink. Now, Reverend, does that mean that I shouldn't drink at all? 
Proverbs 20, verse 1, Proverbs 23, verse 29, Proverbs 23, verse 22, Isaiah 5, verse 11, Nahum 1, verse 10, Habakkuk 2, verse 16. Just read the Bible yourself. The key is, is that Daniel realized that I cannot be my best self if I'm eating the king's food and drinking the king's liquor. Okay. Amen to myself. If you Presbyterians won't say amen to me, amen to myself. Amen. You see, what Daniel was trying to say, matter of fact, as a footnote, here it is, here it is. Some people will say, Reverend, there's nothing wrong with drinking. Understand the Jewish law, do you know they went three to five parts water for every one part wine? Okay. So this wasn't top shelf they was drinking. It was watered down. Can you say watered down? Let me move quickly. Okay, okay. The king's food, y'all, the reason Daniel really couldn't eat it because it was offered to idols. And what Daniel was taught as a young child, understand Daniel is somewhere between 15 and 18 when this takes place. He's not a 20-some or 30-some or 40-year-old man. This is still a teenager. And this teenager, y'all, understands what mama and daddy have taught him about eating bad food and drinking strong drink. Now, I'm going to come to that in a little bit, but understand Daniel and his three friends, they chose to obey God's word and did not compromise with the world. They were determined, y'all, to be faithful to the Lord and steadfast in their commitment to the Holy Scriptures. The decision of his friends, y'all, like many of our lifelong decisions, were motivated on the outgrowth, not so much the outgrowth, but the ingrowth. Daniel wanted to make sure that it's not what I do on the outside that makes a difference, it's what's going on on the inside that makes a difference. Is that anybody's word this Sunday morning, that God is speaking to you about what you do on your inside? Your outside is a secondary movement of what's going on your inside. Your outside Outside is secondary who was happening in here, y'all. Outside is secondary who was going on on the on the inside. You let me break it down like this: When your heart is right, your actions will follow. And every now and then, we might have to take a check up from the neck up and realize what's going on in our heart. Because when our heart is right, then our actions, when our heart is right, then our abilities, when our heart is right, then the things we do will reflect what's in our heart. And you see, if, if I could take a pause for the cause right here, I want you to realize that Daniel was really not talking about what the king put in front of him. Daniel was talking about the king's system. And the system is the thing that we have to recognize in this day and time that we must address the systems to which we un, un, uncover in society today, y'all, are the things that church folk really need to stand up to, the systems, okay? You're not getting it. The systems of society have made our culture not what it could or should be. And recognize what our systems, James Clear says it this way. He says, you don't rise to the level of your goal, you fall to the level of your systems. It's your systems. You don't rise to those levels of your, it's the level of your systems that makes the difference. What are you saying, Reverend? We're here. It's the system that we live in. One in five women in the United States of America experienced, completed, or attempted rape during their lifetime. 24.8%, that's one in four men, will have a, some kind of experience of contact sexual violence in their life. That's a system. 51% of the women that are raped are raped by people that they are intimate with. 40% of the people, the women that are raped, are raped by men and women that they are acquainted with. What you saying here, we got a system. And that system must be addressed. That's why the shout out today, y'all, goes to to uh, to to, uh, to Raina or Burke, to Raina Burke, y'all, the founder of the Me Too movement. She is the one that brought the system to the forefront. You know, hashtag Me Too. This is a woman who was raped at nine. This is a woman raped multiple times as a teenager. But this is a woman when she read "I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings" by Dr. Maya Angelou. She realized that yes, you've got a story 
story, and I've got a story. Here's what she says. She says, when one person says, yeah, me too, it gives permission for others to open up. That's a word, y'all, that we cannot overlook because we live in a system and we deal with people who will lift up systems that oppress and systems that bring people down. And the word of God says ye should know the truth and the truth shall set you free. You've got to have some truth inside of you to speak to some systems, some truth inside of you to lift up justice, some truth inside of you to say, no, we ain't going to take it no more. Is that not what happened 62 years in Greensboro, North Carolina, at those four students who sat down at the Woolworth County? Is that not what happened on February 1, 1960, when these students, not just those four of them, but these students, they were, they were, they were, they were, they were supported by multiple students coming from A&T to sit there at that counter? That's what happened The systems. I talked to one of our members this week, Carl. I said, Brother Carl, where were you on February 1st, 1960? He said, getting arrested. <laughs> I, said, I said, you weren't in the picture. He says, no, Reverend, everybody couldn't be at the counter. Some people got arrested. He got arrested for a system. A system of, of wrong, a system of, of, of discrimination, and, and, and we sometimes might need to get arrested for some systems. Daniel, y'all, he was at the verge of being in prison because the system of King Nebuchadnezzar wanted him to eat a certain kind of food, wanted him to drink a certain kind of drink. But he says, as a child of Almighty God, I cannot fall to your systems. Can you say systems? You see, he, he requested a certain uh, diet, a diet of vegetables and water. We, we know it as the Daniel fast. How many of y'all ever done the Daniel fast before? I mean, how many of y'all stuck with the Daniel fast? <laughs> Thank you, Miss Bridget Ann. We got anybody else, anybody else stick with it? I mean, it's 21 days. Now, you can't do it for two and a half hours and say, I'm on the Daniel fast. <laughs> but it's a system. You see... <laughs> Daniel made the request to the official, but according to the text, Dr. Monroe, he was denied. Which goes me to that, that, that great educator who said it years ago, I think it was uh, th th Thomas, Thomas Bland, who said, if you first you don't succeed, try, try again. That was a teacher talking to students about students, if you don't get your homework done the first time, try, try. It's, get, look it up. It's in Google. It's right there for you. But Daniel tried and tried again, and the text says his request uh, was for 10 days. Give us a certain diet for 10 days. Give us a certain amount of water to drink for 10 days and see if our skin doesn't look better and our brain doesn't look better and our hair doesn't look better. Let's give us some 10 days. Daniel was saying, I've got some new habits. That's a system. And I don't want you to miss that, church, because this text is tailored to teach us some valuable lessons about a system. God gave those, 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 those four individuals, it says, blessed intellectual ability. God gave the four students as they studied, y'all, the ability to understand. And God even blessed Daniel, y'all, with the ability to understand and interpret dreams and visions. Y'all, don't miss this. A profound point in this text is is that Daniel in his testimony was faithful to the Lord. Daniel and his testimony had some good habits. Daniel and his testimony had supportive habits. Daniel and his testimony had some interconnected life-giving habits. What, again, is a habit? A habit is the sum of a total of all small decisions that we make. Don't forget that, y'all. Our life is the sum of a total small decisions that we make. The those decisions you make today determines the story that you tell on tomorrow. Those habits that you have in 2022 have a way of showing up in 2025, okay? The things you do, what we say at the gym, the things we do in the gym in February show up in July. It's hard to get an amen from y'all this morning, I mean... I don't know if y'all still stuck on them brownies or what. I don't know what it is. 
You see, what I want you to understand from the text, y'all, is that, is, is that we must, must be careful, be careful, no matter the pressure that we are placed, placed upon not to compromise. We must stand fast and not give up to the seduction of sin, no matter how appealing or attractive or enticing the urge may be. Get some habits about yourself so you can declare in your heart that you will not be defiled by the world. So, so, so what are the lessons that we learned from Daniel? What are some takeaways that I believe, Pastor Rick, that, that helps us develop some new habits, some, some, some ability to resist temptation and not give in to compromise? Well, well, first of all, remember what I said a couple of weeks ago from Greg Crochelle. He says successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. Successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. And today, don't forget the quote we got from Stephen Covey. What was it? Habit is the intersection of knowledge, what to do, skill, how to do it, desire, and want to do. Habit. What's the first lesson? The lesson from David, from Daniel. Daniel was unwilling to compromise his standards. He was unwilling to compromise. That's the lesson I want us to get and develop some new habits. Don't compromise. When it comes to doing the things of Almighty God, don't compromise. Remember, y'all, that the, the Jews had, had many dietary restrictions on food and, and things were unclean. But, 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 but don't, don't miss the context that drives the content in this text. Let me say it again. Don't miss the context that drives the content in this text. Okay? Don't miss the context that drives the content of this text. What's the context? Daniel, y'all, was upholding the Jewish standards. He was upholding the Jewish standards, and his mama and daddy was nowhere around. Daniel was in exile. He was not in his hometown. He was not with Pookie and them. He was with a stray in a strange land. Nobody knew him, but Daniel still kept the rules. Okay, the context, Daniel grew up in Charlotte, Mecklenburg. Daniel went off to school in Florida. But when Daniel got a job in California, he still remember what he learned in Charlotte, Mecklenburg. Okay, I think y'all with me now. The Bible says that it was only Daniel and the three other Hebrew boys that were on this special diet. All the other folk from Charlotte Mecklenburg, when they went to A&T, they started acting buck wild. All the other folk, when they went to Chapel Hill, they started acting cuckoo for cuckoo. All the other folk, when they left home, they started acting some kind of way. Y'all see what I'm going? You see, the context delivers us to understanding the content that you've got to know what's in your heart. You've got to know who you are. You've got to have some identity about yourself. Don't get so high up that you forget where you come from. Don't forget that somebody has sown into your life. Somebody has blessed your life. Somebody has prayed for you. Somebody is lifting you up. Don't forget where you come from, baby, because God and only God is the only one going to take you where you want to go. The text, the text, y'all, lets us know don't be so caught up in the peer pressure, the peer pressure of the text. Why? Because peer pressure will make you compromise. And I got to just keep putting my weight on that compromise thing right there, Brother L, because I believe the text is saying don't compromise your family. Y'all don't compromise your family for other things that you want to do. Make sure that you love your family. Married folk, don't compromise your marriage. Don't be trying to look for something in somebody else's bed when you got somebody in your own bed. Don't compromise taking care to, to taking care of family members. You, you have only the family that you have right now. If you've got a mama or a daddy or a sister or a brother or auntie or uncle, somebody that you can pour into, don't compromise and let somebody else take care of them. You take care of them yourself. Don't compromise paying your bills. There's no way in the world that a good believer ought to have bill collectors calling your house. Test, what is this thing on? 
don't compromise paying your tithe. Well, you know, Reverend, when I get out of this bind, I'm going to start giving something to the Lord. Don't you know the reason you can't give to the Lord? Because you got out of the bind with the Lord. Don't compromise being responsible. Men, be responsible. Mamas, be responsible. Church folk, be responsible. Don't, don't compromise reading your word. Read the word. Study to show thyself approved. A work person needeth not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Don't compromise spending time with God. In essence, I'm saying, don't, will you help me preach? Say, don't compromise. Second lesson we learned from Daniel, here it is quickly, that victory begins in the heart. It begins in the heart. We find this in chapter 6 of Daniel. For chapter 6 gives us Daniel's daily routine. What it says to us is that Daniel uh, daily knelt toward Jerusalem with his window open to pray to God three times. The Bible says, and Daniel heard about the law, but when he returned home, he went upstairs, prayed in front of the window that faced Jerusalem in the same way that he had always done. He he knelt down in prayer three times a day, giving thanks to God for all God has done. What you're saying, Reverend, I'm saying that Daniel teaches us is that we've got to get God and keep God close to our heart. If you got God close to your heart, God will help determine your actions and your steps. When God is close to your heart, there's no a question about what you're about and who you're about. You, you've got to listen to Daniel and understand, though the handwriting says, if you do these things and if you act this way and if you say these things, you may be thrown into prison. But Daniel says, no, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will do God's will. Everything in Daniel evolved around God. Again, y'all, victory begins in the heart. How do you develop those habits? Let me give it to you quickly. You get a habit by what we call a habit loop. A habit loop, y'all, is a cue, a response, and a reward. A cue. What is my cue? It's time for me to wake up. That's my cue. That's time for me to say thank you. What's my, what's my response? My response is falling on my knees and lifted up my hands to give God thanks. What's my reward? God gives me the peace that passes all understanding. Okay, let me give you the loop again. The cue is, is that when I think about the Lord, okay, my response is, I give God thanks. Okay, my reward is, God keeps on blessing. Oh, you're missing it right there. It's a loop, y'all. When you understand that you are who you are, oh, that's the cue. And you have what you have, that's the response. And you want more to give back to somebody else, that's your reward. It's a loop, okay? Your habit loop. How do you create a habit loop? You've got a trigger, you got a reward, and you got an action. You got a trigger, you got a reward, and an action. You've got to understand your habits come this way. Chapter 6 of Daniel helps us realize that the Bible says that three times a day he looked toward Jerusalem, opened up his window, and he prayed out, giving God thanks for who God was. You see what I'm saying in the text, y'all, and I don't want you to forget it, is that, is that the many lessons that Daniel teaches us are lessons really about starting some habits. You see, if Daniel had not gone through the Daniel fast in chapter 1, he never could interpret the king's dream in chapter 2. If Daniel had not gone through the Daniel fast in chapter 1, he never, y'all, could have basically uh, come out of the lion's den in chapter 6. If Daniel had not gone through the Daniel fast in chapter 1, we'll never talk about the prophecy that Daniel gave about the coming of the Messiah. Oh, you follow what I'm saying? you got to start some habits. As you start these habits, they will help you develop your testimony. What's the last thing I want to say to you? See, Daniel overcame the habit of his appetite because his appetite was the leading cause of sin. How do you say that? How in the world did Adam get in the trouble that he got in? With his appetite. What was the temptation, the first temptation uh, of, of, of the, that, that, that God's son, Christ, had to experience in the wilderness when the devil says, why don't you take these rocks and turn them into bread? It was about the appetite. And you see, y'all, good habits are formed when you learn how to control your appetite. 
Y'all need to expand that because they need to see what that appetite is. They let them see really what that is. Control your appetite. And y'all know I'm not just talking about appetite of food, but you need to control your appetite of your work. Are you working too much? Control your appetite where you rest, your appetite of where you play, and your appetite of where you lay. Come on, somebody. Say amen. Let's talk about your spending appetites and your savings appetite and your drinking appetite and your socialization appetite. You, what triggers do you have right now? What, what's the cue that leads you to an action and or reward? What, 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 what is it about you and your appetites? What's your temptation? Y'all know I can't drive past Concord Mills between 6 and 10 o'clock at night or 6 and 10 in the morning when that red light is on. That's a trigger. <laughs> so I don't even go that way no more to Canapolis. No, I can't even go that way. I'm thinking about it right now. Forgive me, God. But if I want to look different in June, I got to start something different in February. If, if I want to look different in 2023, I've got to have some habits in 2022. Good habits are formed when you learn to control your appetite. That, that's, why, that's why we close, we close, we close. I didn't know exactly. I told Brother David, Sister Margaret, Brother Mike the other night, I didn't know how, uh, Brother Chris, we were going to do this closure. But, but I finally got a quote last night as I was looking uh, through the news reports on, on the whole, uh, uh, whole uh, Brian Flores situation. And it came from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. That is the conference founded by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King for advocacy of justice back Back in the 60s, the SCLC says we stand with Miami Dolphins coach Brian Flores, who has exposed racism and discrimination in the NFL. He says we stand with him, the SCLC. Why? Because they're saying that what Brian Flores has stood up for was against a system. And he says the system itself is flawed. The system itself has some holes in it. I'm talking the Southern Christian Leadership Council has saying that we as church people, we stand behind any and everything against uh, the discrimination. Here's what he says. Why? Because as Coach Flores has clearly stated, this is bigger than football. You see, y'all, when you understand the systems that we must face as a people of God, we have to stand on the word knowing it's only the blood of Jesus that never loses its power. The blood of Jesus that gives us strength. The blood of Jesus that wipes away our sins. It's the blood of Jesus. The Jesus not your name. <laughs>